So well, let's uh, continue with our second panel. Uh, we've heard a lot now, I think also very concretely, both, both the situation uh, in the countries we're most concerned about, but also some very concrete proposals. Uh, now we have another very interesting panel of people who again aren't just talking, but doing things. Um, I just quickly introduce who we have on the panel, Michael McNamara, a human rights lawyer and member of the Irish Parliament, who's been extremely active on these issues. Um, when we criticize the Council of Europe, it's always important to remember that uh, there are battles ongoing in those institutions, and there are those who are fighting to preserve their dignity and honor. And he's been very active in all the debates that we've just mentioned, defending human rights. Khadija Ismailova, um, uh, she has to explain to us what keeps her going, because there have been a lot of pressures on her, and yet uh, she has not been intimidated. She's the most uh, well-known investigative journalist in uh, Azerbaijan today, and I think uh, one of the stars of investigative journalism in the whole region. Um, she always says she's not an activist, but she's been forced into this role simply by speaking out for basic decency and uh, the conditions that you need to do journalism. Uh, then we have uh, Bill Browder, who has been a businessman in Russia, but is most well known in the last few years for his support for uh, a campaign on behalf of justice for one of the victims, concrete faces of the deterioration of the situation, a prisoner, Sergei Magminsky, who died in a Russian jail. And he will tell us more about the lessons he's learned and what this tells us about what might work moving forward. And of course, Christoph Schneisser will be his introduction, uh, who will then sum up from uh, the point of view, both of uh, somebody who knows the Council of Europe, but also represents the most important uh, government of the big democracies. Uh, in those debates, it was very interesting that while all the Russians voted on one side, in the debates in January 2013, all the Germans voted on the other side. So perhaps there is hope. Uh, particularly to discuss these issues here in Berlin of uh, turning the tables. But well, let's start with uh, Michael McNamara. Perhaps if you want to speak from there, I think the microphone might be better. Or you want to speak from there. Okay. Just uh, hello to my first person. I can set it at 10 minutes. Okay, sorry. And firstly, I should say that I didn't ever intend to become a, an activist on the issue of Azerbaijan. Uh, one of my first uh, sessions at the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, I was brought for lunch with some of my Irish delegations by um, a couple of Belgian lobbyists and the issue of Azerbaijan arose and you know, we were asked well, would you like to go to Azerbaijan, you know, maybe you'd like to fly through Istanbul and stay in a nice hotel and said, yeah sure I'd love to go to Azerbaijan, I, mean, I used to go there a lot in the past and they said oh, oh okay, in yeah, mean, what context? And I said oh I was a, a human rights officer with the OSCE and I kind of had the impression that well, maybe they were less interested in having me to Azerbaijan and then I said, ah, no, but I still really love to go, you know, it was a country that I felt was somewhat unfairly criticised in the past, maybe relative to other OEC member states. Um, but of course, if I go, I would like to, uh, to visit some of the, uh, the political prisoners that were there. And uh, I'm not sure if we got as far as dessert, but I certainly didn't get as far as visiting Azerbaijan in that particular context. I did, however, go to Azerbaijan just a week and a half ago. The, Bureau of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe was held there, and I'm the Deputy Chair of the Legal Affairs Committee. And so, in that context, I went. Before I went, I wrote to the President uh, requesting permission to visit political prisoners. That didn't happen. I didn't receive a reply. I didn't really expect one, but I did have the opportunity to engage with the Foreign Minister of Azerbaijan in their Parliament, and that was televised by media. It was, all media was supposed to be invited. Um, I'm not sure that all media would be there. Certainly, um, uh, BBC uh, as early service were there and RFE were there. Uh, they did record it and they did broadcast it all the to uh, their limited audience. Um, I, don't, I doubt very much that as early national television broadcasts the, the entirety of the interaction. Uh, but I did uh, point out that Amnesty International, which is very rich, Rights of the body claimed in the day as a general soon the chairmanship of, of the Committee of Ministers that there were 18, but then 18 um, alleged uh, prisoners of conscience, and also that um, on the day that Christoph Strasser's resolution was voted down by the Parliamentary Assembly, another resolution on the honouring of uh, Azerbaijan's commitments was um, accepted, and that did actually specifically mention. Uh, political prisoners and called on Azerbaijan to carry out certain acts which it 
not only had failed to do, but actually had made life a lot more difficult and more active in political life. To figure out, I suppose, why that happens, I mean, I, I think it's a little bit unrealistic to focus on the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and expect it to be a, a beacon of hope in an otherwise dark uh, Europe. Um, because, um, um, sorry, uh, my timer is not, so I'm leaving it on. Um, because the Treaty of London, which establishes the, the Council of Europe, sets out in Article 25 that there should be a, a, a consultative assembly uh, and that the members shall be um, representatives of each member state. And to a large extent, they act as representatives of their member states. And I think you can't. There's a tendency, I think, among member states to sort of delegate their conscience to international bodies that they can sort of get on with the dirty business of, of energy supply while, you know, somebody else can be our conscience. And I don't think that's how, how life works. I and mean, one of the previous speakers said that there was a hope in Azerbaijan that it might be regarded as a funny part of the country the caucuses. But of course it's not. It's, a, it's an important alternative. It's probably the only one of the only alternative energy sources for Western Europe. And the Azeri government, I think, is very well aware of that. I mean, if you look at the, the president of Azerbaijan, the, degree, the, the decorations he's received, I mean, maybe this is normal and I'm naive, but I, I don't think that the Irish president, which is another relatively of the part of the country in the of Europe, let's be real, but I don't think that the Irish uh, president has been awarded the Order of the Star of Romania, uh, the or Order of the Honour of Georgia, the Grand Cross of the Legion of Honour of France, the Order of the Merit of the Republic of Poland, uh, the First Class of the Order of Prince Yaroslav the Wise of Ukraine, Gold Medal of the Hellenic Republic from Greece, the Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the Three Stars of Latvia, the First Class of the Order of the State of the Republic of Turkey, and the Order of Liberty of Ukraine. Uh, of course, he wouldn't have been decorated by the um, CIS either, because Ireland is the holder of the CIS. But, you know, that's, uh, I think we really have to look at that. I mean, one of the last, one of the most controversial issues regarding the visit to, um, to the Bureau visit to Baku was the fact that a, that a French uh, parliamentarian was denied a visa because he had previously visited the Gordon Karabakh. Uh, he had visited the Gordon Karabakh through Armenia rather than, than uh, from Baku. But one of the last things I saw when I left um, Baku uh, was a magazine with a, a photograph of um, a smiling President Ali on the cover beside a smiling President François Hollande of France on the cover. And I mean, they are the, the reality of whatever sort of minor um, <coughs> criticisms countries might like to make. I mean, the reality is that to a large extent, I think countries' attitudes are determined by how they, they trade in the same way that, that, that people can be be members of or subscribers to all sorts of uh, ecological movements, human rights movements, but at the end of the day their power is as consumers in their supermarkets or markets. And I mean if you just look at um, if you look at some recent press releases, um, uh, Etartas reporting that Azerbaijan and France have signed seven documents on cooperation in transport, energy, agriculture, science, gender, gender policy and education. So that was in, in, in May. Um, you know, one of the first, the first actually country that uh, President Ali visited after his recent, uh, well, relatively controversial election in uh, in October 2013 was Turkey. And this weekend, there are media reports of major trade between Turkey and Azerbaijan, increasing the Turkish share of the Shadanese offshore gas field and the South Caucasus pipeline from nine to nineteen percent. Um, you know, the same is true of Britain. I mean, it's a uh, Britain's, uh, this information is, is from the Azeri Foreign Ministry rather than the British Foreign Office, but at the same time it does list a recent high level visit of President Aliyev to Britain uh, in August 2012 during the Olympics and um, talks about the economic cooperation, especially in the energy sector between the two countries, is a core of bilateral relations between the Republic of Azerbaijan and the United Kingdom. Um, you know, the same is true across. Board. And it's not just major powers like Germany, uh, France, and the United Kingdom. It's also minor non-aligned countries, or relatively minor non-aligned countries. I'm calling Ireland a minor non-aligned country. Uh, I'm not calling Finland a minor non-aligned country. It's a major non-aligned country, as 
as Austria. Uh, but they are also in the process of concluding uh, bilateral trade deals with that's So I suppose what I'm saying is that you can't expect, I mean, foreign ministries of those countries are, are, are I led to believe, lobbying their own members in the parliamentary assembly. And obviously they're not lobbying their ambassadors to act to the decision of the Council of Ministers, they're directing them. Um, and they're directing them to act in the interests of their capitals. So it's a little unrealistic. I mean, I, I welcome a lot of what's been proposed, this pace watch course is great. I mean, it's, it, it's I think, the um, economy's my, it's my stopwatch stuff for working. I just don't want to go over here. Yeah, um, so I think what I'm saying is that it's in, it, we should, of course, focus on the parliamentary assembly of the Council of Europe. We should, of course. So when I was in Azerbaijan, I was largely stonewalled on the issue of this business by the foreign minister. Um, including the fact that that day the European Court of Human Rights attempted on this joint. But he did acknowledge that they were involved in lobbying and that they didn't invent lobbying and that they were carrying it out. There is extensive lobbying with the parliamentary assembly. I'm not seeking in any way to, um, to excuse it or condone it. I think it's appalling. I mean, I think people should have integrity in public office. Of course they do. But it's not just lobbying, it's also direction from their own capitals that affect how. Put up a presentation on the computer. Uh, I think it's very important these points that you just made. That in the end, of course, uh, in the Council of Europe, one of the most egregious failures has been in the Committee of Ministers. I mean, in the end, there we have representatives of the member states. So we have these 47 member states, many of whom are democracies. And in Vienna, a few months, uh, a few weeks ago, when Azerbaijan presented its priorities for the chairmanship. Uh, at the very moment when there were these human rights uh, violations and sentences, uh, no uh, member of the Committee of Ministers raised their voice. And of course in the past it was possible for members of the Committee of Ministers to do that. There were countries that, for example, took Greece to court uh, when Greece became a dictatorship. There were countries that took Turkey to court. But the Committee of Ministers, the member states that Michael pointed to, uh, have not done anything. So one of the lobbies, one of the advocacy efforts must of course also be directed at them. Well, Kadija, you've set up. Um, what uh, do you recommend? Yeah. Hi, my name is Kadija Ismailova. I'm an investigative journalist. Uh, I do investigate fortune of my president and his family. And uh, I discovered several uh, offshore companies in Panama through which they hide their business interests in Azerbaijan and in other countries. And um, uh, together with my colleagues, we also found where they invest their money. Uh, their money. It's British Virgin Islands, off different offshores, and Europe, uh, Dubai and Europe. Uh, in Czech Republic, for example, the president's daughter and father-in-law has a lot of uh, had uh, multi-million property. Next story that will come will about the multi-million property in United Kingdom of president's family. Basically, uh, we've been uh, we have to admit that the, the presidents of the post-Soviet countries, uh, for example. Mr. Putin, Mr. Aliyev, Mr. Nazarbayev, even Mr. Lukashenko, they have more money than Angela Merkel, than, uh, than uh, well, they, all, all the presidents of, uh, of uh, Western, uh, Western Europe altogether. And uh, actually, this is a, uh, this is a source, this is, for some reason, it's not a sort of, source of uh, shame for them. It's a source of pride. And I personally have been witness of one uh, pair of uh, our oligarchs speaking about his experience of bribing a policeman in London. And uh, he's been saying that, what are you talking about? Like Europe? I, uh, I can tell you how I bribed a policeman in, in London. They do take bribes. And I wonder if their fathers also share their experience of bribing European politicians in the Council of Europe and, and uh, basically uh, having these uh, anecdotes of uh, bribing European politicians. I don't know if they share those stories among each other and if that's a, uh, uh, that's a fun story for them. Uh, but uh, I want to thank the politicians here 
for uh, proving that not everyone can be good. And uh, that's, thank you for, uh, thank you for this. Thank you for uh, letting us to tell the story of Europe, which you cannot buy. Uh, because uh, this is the, this is the, this is, uh, this story is, is more and more difficult to say in Azerbaijan. Uh, why I brought this picture? Uh, I don't know how many of you know about uh, the tale of uh, Alexander Sergeyevich of Pushkin uh, on fishermen and goldfish. Basically, the guy catches the fish, and fish uh, uh, fish fulfills the three dreams of the uh, of the fisherman. So uh, I don't know whether uh, the fisherman was. Uh, who, who was a fisherman and whether the fish was true, but the sea was definitely a Caspian Sea. And when, the, when our president came to uh, came and caught this fish and uh, asked to solve all these problems, fish said, you need just two things. You don't need three dreams. You need just two things. It's oil and cabin. And uh, so uh, basically Caspian Sea provides uh, two main commodities that are being used for uh, for bribing and convincing in Europe. Uh, so we are talking about political prisoners in Azerbaijan, and I want to share the latest news with you today. The penitentiary system's website posted a letter. The letter you, you can see here by Bhakti Arthur. This guy, he's one of the eight leader prisoners. Uh, these guys uh, are imprisoned, like the, the NIDA case is based on their protest actions uh, in January 2014, uh, 13, uh, one year ago. They protested non-combat deaths, uh, non-combat mortality in army. Basically, soldiers in Azerbaijani army were dying because of corruption and mismanagement. And these guys staged protests, like mainly eight people, like not this particular guy, but Nida was on the lead of those protests. And what happened next? The government, uh, it was, the government suppressed the, uh, uh, the protest actions, there were several of them. Uh, I was also detained in one of those protests and uh, sentenced to uh, pay fine and then street sweeping for uh, uh, for attending a rally. And, but these guys later were arrested uh, and they were sentenced to six to eight years in prison. And uh, one of them, one of the young and non-leading members of NIDA, now writes a letter saying that while in prison, he found himself realized that he has been implementing wrong ideas of provocateurs, and he demands from relevant structures not to relate political prisoner notions to him. And last sentence is, I don't mind publication of this letter in mass media. And this letter appeared on the website of the government's penitentiary system. And uh, another letter they claim was sent to the president where he asks for pardon. And he thinks this letter will uh, come. Well, this letter is, uh, we collect these letters because it's a literature of oppression. Uh, and uh, it reminds us the Stalin time. And what, what would make Stalin pale in comparison with Aliyev is this case of Mr. Dashkin Melikov. He's, uh, he's a young activist. Uh, he used to be very active in Facebook. He's one of the Facebook prisoners. He was a member of the uh, Popular Front Party. And uh, he wrote a similar letter, and this is what happened. He was pardoned, and with a convoy, he was brought to the uh, cemetery where Haydar Ali, the father of Ilham Ali, Great is, and uh, he that's that was the price for his freedom. He had to lay flowers to Haydar Aliyev and his late wife. That's great. 
So you have to lay flowers to President's uh, father and mother's graves to get him uh, free from prison. These are the, uh, this is the youth act. So who, who is getting in prison? These are the youth activists. Why they got in prison? Because they were popular and because they were not controlled. And these, they dared to stage rallies. Uh, after the rallies, the, the government actually had to change the Minister of Defense. Well, it didn't change the system and uh, it didn't uh, help to improve much, but at least there was some attention to the situation in army. And in, in the past year, we had 20 deaths less in the army than in all previous years. So the, uh, the soldier mortality, non combat so soldier mortality was uh, skyrocketing in the past years and it went down last year because the government had to pay attention because, because of these guys' uh, protests, because the protest actions organized by these guys. But the government doesn't like people who, who make them to make changes and these guys uh, were arrested and these are, the, the figures here are actually show how, how long are these sentences. Uh, Gerald has uh, told about this case and uh, uh, Turgut was also speaking about this case. And I, I want to uh, reiterate something that Turgut was telling you. It's about the support to the uh, political prisoners' families. Well, we try to collect every month's money to support the families, uh, including these ones. And in fact, uh, I'm, I, I'm writing about corruption, I criticize corruption, and then family of the political prisoner comes, the mother comes and says she needs money because she needs to bribe a prison guard to convince him to open the window in summer because her son, who has asthma, needs to breathe to bribe a prison guard to open a window. The window should be open all the time. The, the, that's a prison rule. The, it, there is no prison rule the, that prevents it. But you have to pay for this. It's a privilege in that prison. So these kind of, and I can't say to mother, no, corruption is bad, you shouldn't pay bribes. I can't tell that because pri prison is probably not the best place to uh, uh, to fight corruption instead of when you have an issue of survival. This is another uh, kind of uh, prisoner. He's uh, one of the Facebook prisoners. He's a, Abdul Abil is a young activist. He is imprisoned uh, because he was, he had a very popular page uh, that was called uh, Let's Stop uh, Psychophants. Like ask about the bad language, and uh, the the page was popular, and the guy is, was very active, also in crowdsourcing information from the uh, citizen journalists, and he got arrested. And this is what he said in his final speech in the court. He said, "My father, my grandfather, prominent cleric, was arrested in 1937, Stalin's time." Together with the poet Mikhail Mushrik, uh, today the heirs, the grandsons of those who did or welcome repressions in Stalin's times, want us to live without freedoms like in 1937. So Abdullah is sentenced to five and a half years for in faith drug charges. I was I attended only one hearing on his case. And, he, and this is what I heard in that uh, hearing. Policemen who basically, uh, there was no proof, the, there was the, the, uh, the lawyer, the defense lawyer was proving that police couldn't make a search in his apartment because they didn't have proper documents. Police claimed that Avilov himself invited police to come to his apartment to do a search and find drugs. This is another ridiculous case. He's uh, also a Facebook prisoner, Omar Mamadov. He, is, uh, he was an admin of Selected from Us TV page, uh, where they've been mocking the Us TV propaganda of Aliyev. And uh, 
Here is what we have from his uh, uh, court trial. We've learned in the court trial that his father and he himself were invited to anti-organized crime unit of interior ministry twice before he got arrested. Uh, to, and there they've been warned about online activity of, the, of Omar. And then he was arrested on a drug charge. Uh, indictment claims that he was selling drugs in Baku. But they chose the wrong timing for this uh, claim because according to indictment he was selling drugs in Baku but according to his passport, Omar Mamadov's passport, he was in Cyprus then. And uh, another thing, the witness, and uh, his name is Nurmar Ramov, uh, who, who came to the court to tell that uh, he actually saw Omar Mamad of selling drugs, he is the, that's his job, he's witnessing in the court. And uh, it, simultaneously his name appears in several other court trials where he, uh, he's serving as a witness. So he's a, what we call Stadtli Svidetin. It's a, uh, uh, like witness on duty for the press. This is another guy. He's my colleague, Abba Zeynalli. He got nine years of jail and uh, one year suspension of professional activity on a fake bribery char charge. Uh, he is editor-in-chief of Kural newspaper, and actually he was arrested after fact-checking President Aliyev's interview to Al Jazeera. His story proved that Aliyev was lying in every single sentence of his interview. And then he got arrested, and the claim that he was demanding bribe comes from this woman, she's on the left, on the face to us. Uh, she's Gulara Ahmedova, ruling party MP. She was recently in jail for several months only because, and this is the screenshot from the, uh, it's a still from the video. Uh, in this video, she was demanding one million for appointing someone an MP for ruling party. So she was de negotiating the price of becoming an MP, member of parliament in Azerbaijan with the candidate, with the candidate. What happened after? One million manat was given to her. Then she, uh, then the guy was announced a winner in the elections, but the opposition gave all the proofs that he was not elected. And uh, the, in that particular uh, case, basically the government decided that he's not that important. And uh, they dumped him. The election results were uh, canceled. A note. What happened after? Uh, she didn't return the money, and that's why uh, that's why he decided to release the video after several years of demanding this money. And uh, then she was found guilty uh, for uh, for a fraud, not for uh, the state crime like selling the parliament seats or whatever. For a fraud, she was uh, found guilty, and she spent only several months in prison. Several months. She, her sentence was three years, and she spent not not a full year. Um, so, uh, but I have, and we have these guys, Anar Mamadli and Bashir Suleiman. They uh, they are in jail for uh, reporting election fraud, and uh, Anar Mamadli's verdict is five and a half years. So this is uh, the kind of justice we have. I'm going through the. Uh, I'm going through the, uh, another investigation, and uh, basically we had, there, was, there were questions if I will be allowed to leave the country because I'm, a, with, uh, I'm, I'm being interrogated in the case of revealing the state secrets. And uh, so there are two components in the case. One is my meeting with the US Senate staffers, uh, which uh, the, our government things could be, uh, they could be CIA uh, agents. And uh, second is me revealing this document. I posted this on Facebook and this is, uh, I don't know if that's authentic document or what. I, and I, when I posted it on Facebook, I wrote that I don't know if it's document or not. It's been sent to me 
by a former employee of the Minister of National Security. He lives in France now, so I, uh, I could tell his name, well, he allowed me to name him, uh, Rabin Nadir. So he sent me this, this piece of, this file. And this file is the report of the Minister of National Security employee to his boss, as, like, as it is claimed on the paper. And this, in this report, the guy says that within the plan of controlling opposition, we agreed with this opposition member, opposition party member, that we will pay him 600 uh, manats, which is equal to 600 euros, uh, a month, and he will report to us about <coughs> things in uh, opposition and will create conflicts whenever we will need it. And as a, so we agreed that we will pay him for that. And uh, as a mean of additional pressure on him, so just to make sure that he will not uh, sneak out, uh, we have his video of non-traditional sex with multiple partners. That's what this paper says, and I erased all the names and information that could identify the guy's name, because I don't know if that's a fact, and I don't want to uh, intrude to someone else's privacy. Uh, if that's truth. But, well, uh, it didn't stop Azir government when they intruded my privacy and planted a video camera in my bedroom and then blackmailed me with that video. Well, anyways, this was another proof that the, uh, the government of Azerbaijan, the Minister of National Security, was actually using this methods against opposition and critics. Anyways, what happened next? As I said, I was not sure that it's a document. I was not sure that it's an authentic piece of paper. I was not sure, but State Prosecutor's Office proved that it is. They opened a criminal case on revealing a state secret based on my, me posting this document. So if that's a state secret, it means that it's a document. So this is what happened. Now they, uh, well, after a first interrogation, when I went out and uh, to the press and said, well, I found out that this is a document that I should send the prosecutor's office for that. Well, uh, after the first interrogation, they understood that they've, they've, they've done something wrong. They shouldn't have opened this criminal case. And it, anyways, it's, it's all the time. Well, this is the kind of um, this is the kind of uh, state secrets our government has, and uh, here is the list of people who are in prison uh, now, and uh, some of these groups are in the lists of political prisoners, which some uh, people in Europe and uh, in Azerbaijan have doubts about. It's human rights activists in regions and in, uh, and in uh, the capital. Uh, there are no doubts about that. Politicians, election monitors, bloggers. And we have one group that is being argued a lot about. It's Islamists. Well, I have to say that we do have militant Islamists in prisons. And, but our talk is not about that. The list of political prisoners includes several dozens of moderate Islamists. Islamists who didn't promote any violence, who did not, who did not uh, uh, say that they want a Sharia state in Azerbaijan, who said that they want their daughters to be able to go to school in their headscarves, and they protested for that peacefully protested for that. And the group that, and the clerics who were popular and not controlled by the Minister of National Security and some religious groups of the government. So these people actually uh, are the kind of Islamists who would, who would actually be able to promote the moderate Islam in Azerbaijan, non-violent Islam in Azerbaijan. But they are in prison, and by 
by putting them in jail, the government of Azerbaijan actually made Muslims of the country very angry. And, if, and now there is an ongoing debate, debate in Islamist community of Azerbaijan whether the moderate ways of Islam they've been promoting was the right thing. Maybe we should go and look for other ways of promoting our Islamic views. So by jailing moderate and pro-independence people just for being popular and not controlled by the government, the government actually uh, pushes the religious community to uh, to seeking for new, more radical ways of uh, of uh, the. I think my time is out, and uh, well, uh, I I want to thank you, Mr. McNamara, Mr. Strasser, and uh, other European politicians who help us to prove that Europe is is about values. It's not just about group politicians. Thanks. Thanks about Khadija. And in fact, the last issue you raised was also very important in the report by Mr. Stresser, who also in his report on alleged or presumed political prisoners included a few of those moderate uh, Islamic activists. And of course, this was then uh, used by people in the debate in Strasbourg by saying Mr. Stresser is defending terrorists uh, uh, without, of course, uh, any evidence. But uh, why do you need evidence if you have the votes? Um, now let's go to the brother. Uh, you've been an activist now for uh, some years on the case of Sergei Magnitsky. What have you learned uh, about Europe and about what works in uh, working uh, against political imprisonment and uh, for justice? Thank you, Gerald. Um, I'm kind of an unlikely human rights activist. And as uh, Gerald introduced me before, uh, I was originally a hedge fund manager uh, in Russia, and uh, I, uh, I ended up in this um, field of human rights activism as a result of a, a very heartbreaking story of Sergei Magnitsky. Uh, many of you have heard the name Sergei Magnitsky, probably many of you know the story of Sergei Magnitsky, but for the benefit of those uh, who don't, I just want to briefly summarize uh, what happened to Sergei Magnitsky and how that uh, changed me into an activist and, and how that has led me to a way of dealing with some of these um, infuriating stories that we've heard today so that we have some, some uh, cause of action against the people who do these terrible things. Uh, so I was um, investing in Russia. Uh, I had ran an investment fund called Hermitage Fund. My fund uh, discovered I discovered massive fraud that was taking place in the companies that I was investing in. Companies that you've heard of, like Gazprom, Sparebank, and Blue Oil. The management of those companies were stealing lots of money. And I thought that that was uh, not fair, that uh, they were stealing all the money. And so I, I looked around to see, well, what can I do to, to stop them from stealing the money in these companies that I own shares in? And I discovered that there was really nothing in the official system that you could do. The Russian um, police don't police, the Russian politicians are corrupt, etc. And so I decided to do the only thing that was in my power to do, which was to figure out how they did the stealing, and then to expose it through the international media. And as you might imagine, the people who were stealing money didn't find that too pleasant, and they didn't like me very much. And so after doing this for a few years, I was expelled from Russia in 2005 and I was declared a threat to national security. Um, I quickly got all my people out and I got all of our money out because I figured that um, when the Russians go after you, they don't go after you lightly. Uh, and uh, I thought I was done with Russia, but they were just getting started with me. And uh, 18 months later, the police raided my offices in Moscow and raided the offices of my law firm, Firestone Duncan, we actually had Jameson Firestone, who's sitting up here in the white shirt in the second row, we'll probably talk about this more tomorrow. Um, and the police seized all of the corporate documents of my companies um, that were empty at this point, but they didn't know it. Uh, and 
And then the next thing that we discovered um, was that we no longer owned our companies anymore, and that the police had stolen the companies using the documents they seized from the raid. <coughs> At this point, I hired Sergei Magnitsky, who was a 36-year-old lawyer who worked for Jameson Firestone at this law firm, to help me investigate. And through a very long and, and um, intensive investigation, he discovered that not only had they stolen my companies, um, but the police had stolen $230 million of taxes that we paid um, to the Russian government. And so they weren't just trying to steal our money, which they didn't succeed in doing, but they were stealing the, co the country's own money. The police, together with tax officials and organized criminals, stole $230 million. Sergei Magnitsky discovered this, and as a good patriot of Russia, he decided that he was going to try to uh, get justice for his country, for the stolen money. And he, uh, he ended up testifying against the police officers who were involved in the raid uh, that took the documents <coughs> that he used. And instead of um, investigating the police officers, um, the same police officers he testified against came to his home about a month later in front of his wife and two children, arrested him, put him in pretrial detention, and then started to torture him to get him to withdraw his testimony. They put him in uh, cells with uh, uh, 14 inmates and only eight beds and left the lights on 24 hours a day to impose sleep deprivation. They put him in cells with no window panes in December in Moscow, uh, uh, where there was no heat, so he nearly froze to death. The opposite problem of Azerbaijan. Um, they put him in uh, cells with no toilet, just a hole in the floor um, where the sewage would come bubbling up. Uh, and after after six months of this, uh, he became ill. He lost 20 kilos. He was diagnosed as having pancreatitis and gallstones, and he was needing a, a, an operation. But instead of operating on him, they abruptly moved him to a prison without any medical facilities. And at the new prison, they then denied him all medical care, in spite of writing 20 different requests uh, to every different branch of the Russian penal law enforcement and judicial system begging for medical attention. Uh, the, the pain got so, so intense, he could barely um, stand. Uh, this didn't go on for just a day or a week, this went on for several months. And finally, on November 16, 2009, his, his body finally gave out. Uh, he went into critical condition on that night. And it was only then that they, they decided to move him back to a, to a prison facility that had a hospital. But when he arrived at the prison with the hospital, instead of putting him in the emergency room, they put him in an isolation cell and eight riot guards with rubber batons came into his cell and beat him for one hour and 18 minutes until he died the age of 37. That was four years ago. I learned about this on November 17th, the day afterwards, and it was like a, a, a knife that went right into my heart. And I made a vow then and there that I was going to get justice for Sergei Magnitsky. And uh, for the last four and a half years, I've been on a quest to get justice for Sergei Magnitsky. Um, Gerald's question was, how do you get justice, or what, what, what does one do in these situations? And, and I, 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 as I said, I'm a, I was a trained um, investment manager, not a human rights activist, so I didn't know what you do with a human rights activist. So I went, first thing I did was I went to a friend, who, a friend of a friend who worked at Human Rights Watch, and I said, what do you do in these situations? How do you get justice? And my, uh, this, this person at Human Rights Watch you know, offered to be very helpful and sort of started to advise me on a regular basis, and told me things like, well, you go to the European uh, Union, or the European Commission, and try to get them to bring up the case with the Russians. So I went to Brussels, and, uh, and they got them to bring up the case with the Russians, and the Russians didn't care. And, and, and then she said, how about uh, going to uh, the US State Department and get them to uh, put Sergei's name in their annual human rights report? So I went to the State Department, and, and they dutifully put Sergei's name in the uh, annual human rights report, and the Russians didn't care. Uh, and I kept on escalating all of these normal tools that, that you're supposed to use as a human rights activist, getting, in, getting, getting governments to bring it up, putting in reports, and naming names, and the Russians didn't care. Um, 
Why didn't they care? Because it had no consequence. There was no consequence to anybody. So I said to myself, well, well what, what can we do that, that, that they would care about? And, um, and the answer was um, that they care about these guys do these crimes often for money. Um, it's all about corruption for the most part. Um, why, why are all these people being put in prison in Azerbaijan? I think they're being put in prison by, in Azerbaijan because the government doesn't want, want their corruption exposed. Why did Putin invade uh, Ukraine? He didn't invade Ukraine because he cared about Ukraine. He invaded Ukraine to create a distraction because he's one of the most corrupt kleptocrats in the history of the world. These guys care about their money. And what's interesting is that they care about their money, but they don't. They care about their money so much they don't keep it in, in Russia. They keep it in the West. As Ben Judah said earlier, um, it's all here. And so this gave me an idea, which is, uh, if these guys keep their money in the West, and we see them traveling in the West, and, and you don't have to travel very far in Europe to see rich Russians, then maybe we can take that away from them. And so we came up with this idea of imposing visa bans and asset freezes on the people who killed Sergei Magnitsky. And I went around to various politicians, and, and Mr. Strasser here is one of my, um, one of my uh, collaborators, and I, I went to the European Parliament, and I went to, um, uh, went to the U.S. Congress, and the Canadian Parliament, the British Parliament, and, um, and I got a lot of people interested in this idea. And, um, got the most traction in the United States, and eventually became known as the Magnitsky Act, named after Sergei Magnitsky. And um, the first version of the Magnitsky Act was proposed in October of 2010, and it was, the Act said that, that, that the United States government uh, would uh, uh, impose visa bans and asset freezes on the people who killed Sergei Magnitsky. It was a proposed law. They launched it, and the most interesting thing happened which was after it was launched, every other victim of human rights abuse in, in Russia that had the opportunity to travel to Washington came to these senators, Senator McCain and Senator Carter, and said, this, you figured out the Achilles heel of the Russian regime. This is what they care about, their money and their travel. Can you add the person who killed my brother, my father, my sister, my mother, uh, to your Magnitsky list? And after about 10 of these approaches, uh, the senators decided that they had or, or figured out that they were onto something much bigger than just one case, one tragic case. And they added 65 words to the law to say that not only are they going to sanction the people who killed Sergei Magnitsky, but they're going to sanction the people who have committed other gross human rights abuses in Russia. And, um, and this thing took off like wildfire, and it eventually led to a vote at the end of 2012 in which 92 Senators voted in favor, four against, and the Magnitsky Act passed the Senate. 89% of the House of Representatives voted in favor of it, and President Obama signed it into law in December. And, I, and let me tell you something. This, this is something, this is a piece of legislation that truly terrifies the Russian regime. It terrifies them because it means there's nothing that Putin can do to protect the people who carry out his orders and the orders of his regime gross human rights abuses. When these people do bad stuff, there's a chance that they, those people won't be able to travel again and they'll be sanctioned and their, their assets will be frozen. The idea is not uh, exclusive to Russia anymore. The um, uh, same senator, Senator Carter and McCain, are now working on a, a global Magnitsky Act, which would apply to all countries. It would apply to Azerbaijan. Kazakhstan, Belarus, and all the uh, places where, where, where people are going to be talking about uh, during this conference. And this is the new technology of human rights advocacy. <coughs> it's going after their money and going after their travel. We live in a globalized world now where uh, uh, Khmer Rouge didn't go to San Tropez, but all these guys who are doing this stuff now do, and they want to keep on going to San Tropez. And we've now got leverage to do something to stop them. And so, um, as we all um, brainstorm about what, what needs to be done, we've got a tool, and now this needs to be implemented further in the United States, and we need to get this tool implemented more, more importantly in Europe,
because the people who are doing this are traveling a lot more often to San Tropez and to Sardinia and to Malaga and Marbella than they are uh, to anywhere else. And so uh, for anyone who's interested, I'd be glad to share how we all can work together on this. But uh, this is the thing that it, it shivers up the spines of uh, corrupt leaders and leaders. Thanks a lot for this uh, presentation. I've uh, heard you recently in Oslo, but it's always a, a pleasure because it gives uh, a sense that things are possible. Uh, of course, uh, we've devoted uh, a lot of time to this, a lot of resources, but uh, if people come together and mobilize together, things are possible. Uh, but doesn't have to be defeatist. So, this was also the motto, I think, of the work you did in Christoph Stress did in the Council of Europe. Uh, not to give up. You had four years of special rapporteur for political prisoners. Uh, the mandate was once prolonged. And if we say that the final resolution was that was defeated, uh, there was a resolution that was not defeated. And in a sense, this whole conference is about that resolution which we got through on political prisoners, gave it a definition, and on the basis of this, hopefully, one can act. Uh, yeah, th thank you very much for the invitation and for the possibility to say some words. I don't want to add more examples for the situation in Azerbaijan and what uh, your brother said for the situation in the, the relationships between Western countries and Russia. On behalf of the, the Magnitsky case, I myself would say generally, not um, in this case but in many others, there should be a little bit more courage in the politics of Western countries when they deal with uh, big violations of human rights. This is my first, my first point and because I see uh, that by in, in all debates we have and I think therefore I will make a little bit more than only the, the situation of, of human rights, uh, of, of uh, political prisoners, I feel and I see that in many, many debates in the last Years, not only in the Council of Europe but in the international community, there is a, a, a structure that I feel is very dangerous for the situation of human rights all over the world because some countries are trying to renovate the, the values of human rights that come out of the, for example, of the um, European Human Rights Convention but also the, the General Declaration of Human Rights on the level of the United Nations. I have been in, I think it was in March, on the meeting of the Human Rights Committee in, uh, Commission in, in Geneva, and I had to listen to the speech of the Russian Minister for Foreign Affairs, Mr. Lama. And what he said was very clear. He said, you, the Western countries, have your idea of human rights, and we, and other countries, have another idea of human rights. We have to respect and to accept different cultures, different traditions, and this is why we don't want a uh, longer time to follow that what you understand under the rules. And I think this is the real dangerous discussion we have to, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, make in the, in, the next, in the next year. I feel if this kind of resignation will win in the debate, in the international debate, the, the idea of the general values of human rights has lost. And this is what we do not, we cannot accept. And there are some examples in the last uh, uh, days, in the last months, and in the last years, not only in Azerbaijan. This is what I want to say very, very clearly. Because one of uh, the arguments against my report was you are blaming one country. Because do you not um, try to find out the situation in other countries? Therefore, I think it's a very, very good idea that there is, I think, a motion in the Council of Europe for the next meeting, I don't know when, that there is a, a new uh, special rapporteur for the question of political prisoners in all member states of the Council of Europe. I think this would be a very, very good signal to say it is not only the situation in one country, but we have to look for the situation all, in all member countries of the Council of Europe. I do not know and this is the second point I wanted to, do, to say to this topic. Uh, if it's possible that one rapporteur can get this in, in his job. I know, myself, I know how small the, the, the 
resources are to make such a report. I was uh, supported in the office in, in um, Strasbourg by two persons, and they had not only my report, they had a lot of other reports. And therefore, I feel it's impossible for one rapporteur under the existing structures of the Council of Europe to make such a report. This is what I feel, and I think we should discuss it in the structures of the Council of Europe. I feel if we want to take up this topic, and I feel it's very, very important, there must be another structure, there must be bigger staff, there must be more, more financial uh, output, that otherwise the one who will, who will uh, uh, do it, who will get this, this new report, we will have no real chance. This is the, the second we have, I think, to debate tomorrow that can be the structures to continue uh, this case. But let me come back to Azerbaijan and I just want to, to mention one case uh, that has been, has been a role in the whole uh, debate, but I will repeat it because for me personally it's, it's very important. It's the case of uh, Anam Mamaki. I say it because he was the one who gave me the opportunity to make this report on behalf of the situation in Azerbaijan. He came here to Berlin, uh, I'd say two or three years ago, and he was financed not by the Council of Europe, not that we have wrong ideas, not the Council of Europe supported him to come here, but there was some uh, civil society organizations who made it possible, and he came with a lot of documents. On many, many documented cases I had to, to observe and I had to, to make this list with alleged political prisoners. That is was my, uh, what, what I said, and he stayed here for three days, and all day and all night we, uh, we were sitting together and checking all these lists, all these documents, and then now he is arrested. I feel it's also personally for me, it's a, it's a kind of, of a thing I, I and we all together should not accept. We have, we have uh, commented and we have um, the, the whole process against it. There were 21 um, witnesses that he had frauded some people, that he did spend money uh, for, for any purpose that was not given in, in order. 20 of this, uh, the victims said, no, everything is okay, everything what we gave him as a demand, he, he did and he got the money, it was completely there was one case who said, yes, he is a bad man, but I cannot remember what was really going on. And this was uh, the only case uh, he was um, a, a little bit in a, in a bad situation, but nobody, nobody of the objective observers of this process said he had to be, he could be present for five years and a half. And I think I just want to say it because it's personal uh, for me also a very, very uh, bad situation and I just wanted to mention. Another point is um, what can what can we do, what can politics do, what can civil society do? My first impression when I when I got this this um, report on political prisoners of Azerbaijan the exactly title was follow up on the political on the situation of political prisoners in Azerbaijan. I was not the first to make this report. We had some, some basics from 2002, 2004, and we had a definition, and this was my event, and I started to work. And then there came these this cases where you see uh, the real face of, of what is going on and what character has in such a government. Three times, I asked for a view, three times, and they gave me an answer. The first time they, they told me, yes, you are a nice guy, we like to see you in Azerbaijan. We have a lot of beautiful beaches, you can go there and we can discuss and we spend you all the whole uh, week. And I said, yes, of course, I will come to Azerbaijan, but only to fulfill my, my job, my job as a rapporteur on political prisoners in this country. And then they said, no, you can't come because we have no political prisoners. And then this was the end of all debate with the, the, the Azerbaijan government, uh, the embassy here in Berlin, and with the Azerbaijan government, uh, really. And then, and this is what I want to point out, what is, is the, the question also for the future. Uh, Michael McNamara mentioned that there was a meeting of the bureau in Azerbaijan, in Baku, 
to present the ideas of the, the presidency of Azerbaijan for the next six, six months. And he said there was a rejected uh, the reason for a colleague from France and René uh, Rouquet, and it was said he had no allowance to come to Azerbaijan. And what was the reaction of the officials of the Council of Europe? What was the reaction? The only thing I heard is that in the next two years there may be no meeting of any committee of the PACE in Azerbaijan. And this is all. And I think if this is the reaction of this old 60 years old organization that stands as no other organization for democracy, for rule of law, for um, human rights, if that is, that is the only reaction. I do not know which way this organization will go in the future, but there are every government who says we don't want to accept a mandate, we don't want to accept a member, an elected member of the, the institution of, of the Council of Europe, we will reject him to come to the country. I think this is, and therefore I think it's, it's really, really important. The decision which way the Council of Europe will go, not only, I say it very, very clear, not only in the direction of Azerbaijan, but especially in what its task to save human rights in the member states, this decision will come in the next year. And I do not know if, if, in which way this um, decision will go. I just remember one, and then I, I don't want to come back to this debate in the in the Parliamentary Assembly about this, this, uh, um, uh, this report uh, on the situation in Azerbaijan. One colleague, one delegate from, not from Azerbaijan, from a Western country, I remember very, very good, told me in this debate, what is that what you are doing? How can you write a report on the situation in a country you have never been? This was a question to me, and I only could answer this, you are the, the persons, you are the people who got that I could go to this country. And though I couldn't go to the country, I have a lot of information to make this report, and this shows in, in which way this instrument of the Council of Europe is instrumentalized for political interests that have never been in the, in the basics of the Council of Europe. And this is what I want to do. To, to discuss for the for the next future, I want, and I think we have good friends who, who, who will go this this way uh, together with us. I will uh, reach a situation the Council of Europe can do this job. That every rapporteur for any question of any uh, um, violation of human rights can do his job, and that he gets a fair chance to make a report and to discuss it in the political level that is not uh, biased by any proposals for Erdogan or what. This is, uh, I think, we have to, to, look, to look for, and once again, it is not only the situation in Azerbaijan. We discussed about the situation in Russia. It is had to discuss about the situation as say very clearly what I saw in the last, last weeks about the development in Turkey. It's not what I say. There are values, democratic values of the European Convention of Human Rights fulfilled. And this is what we have to say and always very clearly, very frankly. And this is what every government in the Council of Europe has to do. And this is what, why I understand my job to go to this and this is my, my last sentence. We only, we, the Western countries, all the countries and all the members of the Council of Europe who are in favor of such a direction must prove that they are credible. And this means we all, we have to accept with an open debate about the human rights situation in all member countries of the Council of Europe, in our own countries, but also nobody has the right to say we deny that other delegates, elected delegates from the committees of the Council of Europe are denied to enter the country where they have to make their, uh, their job. This is what I feel is the next, must, must be the next steps, and therefore I enjoy very much that this conference is here because I hope we have some proposals that will be discussed tomorrow. But there are some proposals to bring, it, bring us on this way to save these values that are new uh, 60 years for all member countries of the Council of Europe. Thank you very much.
Well, thanks a lot, Mr. Stressler, for, for this uh, appeal to do things and also this promise that uh, the Human Rights Commission of the German government is certainly going to pay close attention to this. We will discuss all these ideas further and perhaps what the speaker said before, uh, a democratic international might emerge. Because there are other countries, I've had discussions with uh, governments, or parliamentarians in Europe, who also feel that uh, this is a real crisis that their institutions are, uh, our institutions are taking away from us. Uh, so we've had a lot of concrete proposals here uh, about from helping uh, political prisoners that are left largely without help at the moment to uh, how to clearly identify who needs this help uh, to uh, setting up structures that can work more effectively, not just repeating uh, structures that have proven too weak and to not have enough resources to targeting the real interests from visa bans to uh, asset freezes um, to shaming uh, people who are uh, supporting autocrats um, and above all else to keep this issue alive to remind ourselves of the faces that we've talked about because in the end this is probably the most important task that we have and now it's because of the civil society um, not to forget the individuals because in the end this crisis has also erupted and gone so bad because so few think tanks and so few media uh, and so few parliaments uh, have paid attention. If we would have listened to the debates in the Council of Europe in the last three years, we might have been warned about some things that happened later and that made headlines in Russia and in Turkey and in Ukraine and elsewhere. So it would have been the trip wire to warn us, uh, but very few people paid attention. And I want to, uh, I want to reiterate the timing. The timing is now. While Russian delegation has lost its voting rights in Council, in Parliament Assembly of Council of Europe, it is time to come back to the political prisoners issue and to highlight it because it's Russia who helps all the groups from post-Soviet uh, countries to imprison decent people. It's Russia who helps them, who helps them to do that. And it's time, time is now, while Russia is out of voting rights. It's because the 80 Russian members uh, lost their voting rights, not over human rights, but over Ukraine, which is very, very important. But there's another decision coming up in a few weeks, and I think we should try to make this also an occasion for debate. There will be a new general secretary elected from the Council of Europe. And I think all the candidates should be asked by media, by civil society, what they promise to do about, about this crisis. You know, there will be an election in a few weeks' time. So, if, if uh, Russia was mentioned, I just want to, to add uh, one small uh, meeting during my, my, um, my reports. When I only had the report on the uh, situation of political prisoners in Azerbaijan, I had a good cooperation with the Russian delegation. They told me, we don't know if we are in favor, but we will abstain. And this was the argument that we had a good chance to win. And then came the second, the second mandate that was only the definition of the question of political prison. And then there was a big change in the Russian delegation. They came to me and said, okay, we told you if you only go on the situation in Azerbaijan, maybe we support you. But now, if you have the mandate to make this definition for political prisoners in general, we can't support you anymore. And they didn't mention, but I added for me, because we might be the next country where it's to check. This is one of the situations we just now have in the Council of Europe. And I think, think once again, it's a very, very uh, dangerous event. that we brought along called Why Europe Needs a Magnitsky Act, which is a collection of essays from some of the most famous human rights activists around the world, including a number of people who are here today. Um, it's, the copies are there for you to grab and take and read. And I also want to point out there's a very good website of Justice for Sergei Magnitsky. Uh, there is a very interesting debate which took place a few weeks ago at Oslo on the website of the Norwegian Helsinki Committee with very good presentations uh, by former political prisoners, including the activists of Pussy Riot, Sona Prava. Um, there will be a lot more material available on our website, the ESI website, 
Um, and after this meeting, it wasn't meant to be academic, which was meant to bring actors together to discuss what to do next. Um, we will continue the debate. Um, yes. what, what will you be able to do in the Council of Europe? Uh, I think that's something we can discuss tomorrow. But this is one point uh, I, I'd like to make, and that's that, you know, any criticism that I've made of Azerbaijan isn't a criticism of a governing party in Azerbaijan, it's a state of violations of human rights committed by in the name of the state. And I mean, if we, we, I think that, you know, at, at previous sessions of the Council of Europe, um, Magnitsky has come up and will hopefully come up again in the future. There's a, a draft uh, resolution. But there's, you know, I do want to restore balance. Um, Snowden also addressed the Council of Europe and addressed it from uh, Moscow because he couldn't come through any Western European state because if he did, he would have been uh, uh, seized and extradited to Washington. I mean, we should. Bear that in mind, we shouldn't start to pretend that somehow former Soviet states are uh, sort of there be dragons and here there's, you know, once you cross that former Iron Curtain, there's respect for human rights, openness, transparency, all those good things. And, and it's a simple sort of that there is sort of that simplicity of good and bad, and which is a sort of, a, I think, a feature of, we risk having that as a feature of this debate. But well, I think this is a very good conclusion because it underlines that the Council of Europe was created on the basis of the assumption that all democracies are perfect. That is the very idea of having a court for democracies. And that all democracies need to be held and hold each other to account. Uh, but of course these courts fail, the European Court of Human Rights fails, uh, when it is mocked. When it's not an isolated violation by states, but when it becomes systematic. And that is, I think, the crisis we have now. It was meant to be a club for democracies only, that assumed and accepted they were perfect and needed to be held to account by each other. And now it's become a club that the chair of it is an autocracy that is mocking its values and gets away with it. Now on this note, and uh, with great thanks to our panelists, Khadija came from Baku, Michael came from uh, Dublin, and Bill from London, and of course Christoph Schlesser, I want to thank you for your attention and interest and patience. We've had more than two and a half hours, which is a long time to sit in a room. Uh, uh, but I hope it was worth it for, for you and I hope we will continue to just the beginning of a series of events. Uh, thanks a lot to everybody.